October 20th, 1944 was a momentous day for the history of the Pacific War. On that day, the U.S. 6th Army came ashore on the beaches of Leyte. The previous evening, Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf's surface ships had commenced a thunderous 36-hour bombardment, one of the most intense of the war. Oldendorf's ships pummeled Leyte's beaches, effectively leveling all the shore defenses. Then, at 10 a.m. on October 20th, the first wave of American assault troops boarded their landing craft. When they hit the beach, they encountered only light resistance. The landing zones were declared secured after only 30 minutes of fighting. At 1 p.m., General Douglas MacArthur came ashore. In a carefully choreographed scene recorded by Army photographers, MacArthur waded through the surf wearing his trademark sunglasses. In grandiose fashion, he declared to onlookers that he had returned, making good on the promise from two years earlier. Indeed, it was a historic moment. It served as the beginning of a 10-month campaign to retake the Philippines, an operation that finally ended in August 1945 at the cost of more than 16,000 American and 348,000 Japanese lives. But more immediately, the October 20th landing set into motion a series of events that led to the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the largest naval battle in the history of the Pacific War. From his base at Brunei, Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita learned of MacArthur's arrival, and he ordered the execution of Shogo-1, the combined fleet's Hail Mary plan to catch the U.S. Navy with its back against the shores of Leyte. Kurita had not previously known where MacArthur intended to invade, but Leyte Gulf ideally suited Japanese plans. Several islands, Leyte, Samar, Panayon, Dinagat, and Hamanhan, surrounded the Gulf on all sides. If the combined fleet took possession of the eastern side and Surigao Strait to the south, the U.S. 7th Fleet, and MacArthur's 6th Army with it, would be utterly surrounded. All Kurita needed to do was to get his ships into those important waterways and spring his trap. Time was of the essence. But it did not happen the way Kurita intended. The moment his fleet made its first step, it ran into a pair of hidden predators, two U.S. submarines on patrol inside Palawan Passage. Two boats, USS Darter and USS Dates, took a bite out of Corita's fleet and gave the Americans a crucial warning, ending whatever chance Corita had to make Shogo 1 a surprise. Here's how it happened. At 8 a.m. on October 22nd, Corita's force of 31 ships departed Brunei, commencing a 1,300-mile journey to the Philippines. They headed northeast along the north side of Palawan, a 264-mile-long island that separated the South China Sea from the Sulu Sea. Corita's ships cruised northeast at 18 knots. The Japanese crewmen knew that American submarines tended to prowl the Philippine Straits, and Palawan Passage was an area they frequently inhabited. Unfortunately, Corita's fleet could not afford to take a detour. His center force possessed limited fuel reserves, and the area northwest of Palawan possessed too many uncharted shoals. Like a person running across hot coals, the center force sped its way through the narrow confines of Palawan Passage, hoping to emerge on the other side without incident. But USS Darter and USS Dace were already in Corita's way, both having been sent to Palawan Passage on an unrelated minesweeping mission. At 1.16 a.m. on October 23rd, USS Darter's radar operator noticed several large blips on his scope. He called over Lieutenant Commander David McClintock and informed him that he had detected unknown surface contacts approaching from 17 miles to the southwest. McClintock ordered his crew to man their battle stations. Both submarines were on the surface, only 200 feet apart. From the bridge, McClintock grabbed a megaphone and shouted to Dace's skipper, Lieutenant Commander Bladen Claggett, We have radar contact! Let's go! As the two submarines made haste to the narrowest part of the channel, McClintock ordered his radio operator to send a message to Rear Admiral Ralph Christie in Australia. 
McClintock's message indicated that at least 11 Japanese warships were attempting to move through Palawan Passage. McClintock guessed that at least three of them were battleships. Prior to dawn, Darter and Dace reached the Narrows and submerged. Both skippers hoped that, if they spread out, there would be no way the Japanese could slip by them undetected. Shortly after 5 a.m., Kurita's fleet appeared on the horizon, and both skippers caught sight of them through their periscopes. The larger Japanese ships traveled in two parallel columns, and the destroyers formed a concentric ring around them. At 5.30, the lead cruiser in the port side column, the Otago, sailed right into USS Darter's crosshairs. At a range of 980 yards, McClintock ordered all six bow tubes fired. Then he ordered his crew to spin the boat 180 degrees and to fire the four rear-facing tubes. This time, he aimed at the next cruiser in line, the Takao. Four of Darter's torpedoes exploded against the starboard side of Otago, killing 360 crewmen. Fires raged out of control, and the hull took on water. Swiftly, two destroyers came alongside, recovering 529 men, including Admiral Kurita, who used Otago as his flagship. Just in time, too. In 20 minutes, Otago capsized, going down in 5,900 feet of water. Immediately to its rear, Takao took two torpedo hits to its fantail. The explosions shattered two shafts and three boiler rooms flooded. With two destroyers acting as escorts, Takao fell out of formation. From his position slightly to the south, Dace's commander, Bladen Claggett, observed the chaos sown by Darter. I heard four torpedo hits. Darter is really having a field day. I can see a great pall of smoke completely enveloping the spot where a ship was at last look. I do not know whether it has sunk, but the scene looks good. The ship to the left is also smoking badly. It looks like a great day for the darter. I can see two destroyers making smoke headed for the scene. There is much signaling, shooting of very stars, etc. It is a great show. The big ships seem to be milling around. I hope they don't scatter too far. Light is pretty bad, but I have counted eight large ships, battleships or cruisers, plus two destroyers. Two of these large ships have been hit so far. I hear four depth charges, distant. At 5.42 a.m., Corita's starboard column steamed into the crosshairs of USS Dace. Claggett aimed his boat at the third ship in the column, the heavy cruiser Maya. He recalled the thrilling moment. The situation is beginning to clear up. I have picked out a target, a heavy cruiser of the Otago class. This really is a submariner's dream. Here I am, sitting right in front of a task force. The first two cruisers passed ahead at about 1,500 yards. They were overlapping, appeared to be running screen for my target. They presented a beautiful target. A submarine should have 24 torpedo tubes just to shoot all these targets at once. My target can be seen better now. He looks larger than the two cruisers that have just passed ahead. He has two stacks, and his superstructure appears much heavier. I have not checked the identification as well as I should as I have been busy getting a complete composition of the force which I consider essential for our contact report. At 554 from a range of 1,800 yards, Claggett ordered his crew to fire all six bow torpedoes. In quick succession, four torpedoes slammed into Maya's port side. One exploded inside the forward chain locker, another detonated near the first gun turret, a third torpedo exploded inside a boiler room, and the last one exploded inside the engine room. Claggett stood next to his sound man, waiting for his report, but he didn't need it. The explosions on the Maya were so loud that Claggett could hear them through the hull. I heard two tremendous explosions, both on sound and through the hull. These explosions were apparently magazines, as I have never heard anything like it. The sound man reported that it sounded as if the bottom of the ocean was blowing up. Nothing could cause this much noise except magazines exploding. I have just heard tremendous breaking up noises. This was the most gruesome sound I had ever heard. I was at first convinced that it was being furnished by the dace and called for a check of all compartments and was much relieved to receive reports that everything was all right. No, the noise was coming from the northeast, the direction of the target, and it sounded as if she was coming down on top of us. I have never heard anything like it. Then came a comment from the diving officer. We had better get the hell out of here. 
Claggett was correct. Four minutes after getting hit, powerful secondary explosions blew the Maya to smithereens. It sank in under five minutes, taking with it 336 officers and men, including its captain, O.A. Ranji. With two cruisers going down and another badly damaged, Karita's center force deployed its destroyers. They dropped a salvo of depth charges, forcing Darter and Dace to submerge below periscope depth. Karita ordered two destroyers, Naganami and Asashimo, to remain with the Takao while he took the rest of the center force ahead. For the next hour, those two destroyers peppered the area with depth charges until the rest of the center force took the opportunity to forge ahead and disappear from sight. Hours later, Darter and Dace surfaced to find that all the Japanese surface ships had vanished from the horizon. However, the crews could still see an oil slick leaking from the Takao. Eager to finish it off, Lieutenant Commander McClintock ordered Darter's torpedo tubes reloaded, and his crew began pursuit. Darter possessed only one salvo of short-range electrical torpedoes, which required it to get within 4,000 yards. But every time Darter closed in for the kill, one of the two Japanese destroyers counterattacked, forcing Darter to submerge below periscope depths. Each time, the enemy destroyer dropped a single depth charge, circled a few times to make sure the Darter didn't resurface, and then returned to the side of the Takao. This went on for hours. Finally, McClintock turned to his executive officer, Lieutenant Ernest Schwab, and said, you know, we're not going to get any place this way. We can't get close enough. McClintock contacted Claggett and coordinated with him. They agreed to make a combined attack, with one submarine closing on each side. This way, so the skippers figured, one of their submarines would get past the destroyers. The skippers planned to rendezvous ahead of the Takao, with Dace circling to the south and Darter circling to the north. But unfortunately... Darter experienced trouble calculating its latitude. Lacking accurate star sights, Lieutenant Schwab told his skipper, I don't know where I am in latitude, but if we're in the right longitude, we're going to hit a shoal one of these minutes. McClintock replied, Well, shoals aren't any worse than depth charges. And then, a few minutes after midnight, October 24th, just after McClintock uttered those lines, Darter struck Bombay Shoal at a speed of 19 knots. All but nine inches of Darter's hull was trapped above the waves. Sheepishly, Lieutenant Commander McClintock sent a message to Dace. We are aground. Lieutenant Commander Claggett believed it wiser to rescue the crew of the Darter rather than continue the pursuit of the cruiser. At 1.40 a.m., Dace's crew arrived and connected tow lines. It was high tide, and Claggett hoped he could tug Darter off of the shoal, but it didn't work. Darter was too badly grounded. Reluctantly, McClintock ordered his crew to abandon ship. His men burned the classified documents and a special team rigged demolition charges inside the forward torpedo room. Unluckily, none of the torpedoes exploded, leaving Darter mostly intact. Dace tried to fire its four remaining torpedoes into Darter, but it did no good. The tide had gone out, leaving Darter entirely out of the water on a bed of exposed coral. When dawn came, a Japanese airplane appeared, forcing Dace to quit the area with all of the rescued crew from Darter aboard. Later that day, Japanese aircraft attacked the abandoned wreck, causing further damage to it, but they failed to destroy it. Then, on October 24th and 31st, two other American submarines fired torpedoes into their wreck, but these attacks also failed. Darter remained on the surface for the rest of the war. In fact, neither Navy ever salvaged the wreck. To this day, pieces of the Darter remain on the reef west of Palawan. The wounded cruiser, the Takao, limped back to Brunei. Eventually, repair crews declared its damage irreparable, and after a final voyage to Singapore, the ship was turned into a floating battery. All hands regretted the loss of USS Darter, but back at Pearl Harbor, the commander of subcompact, later called Com Subpack, Rear Admiral Charles Lockwood, said the exchange of one sub for two enemy cruisers was not too bad. Further, Lockwood opined, 
The intelligence transmitted by these submarines to the 7th Fleet at Leyte Gulf was the first tangible evidence of the magnitude of the forces which the enemy was assembling to dislodge us. Its early receipt enabled our fleet commanders to put into execution the countermeasures which resulted in a major disaster for the Imperial Japanese Navy. Lockwood was exactly right. Darter and Dace had spoiled Corita's surprise. <laughs> 